Okay, so we had a little flub here. Obviously, I don't know how to click the button video. So we took four pictures of Mr. Polly reading, whereas we thought we were taking four videos. So he's going to be reading it I again. I have read the whole... <laughs> I have read all of chapter six, and now I have to do it again. All right, here we go. Pray for my suffering I'll voice. go get the phone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oh, hush. Okay. <clears throat> Let's try this again. You know what? We need some hand sanitizer. Maybe I'm really doing... I'm not sure if I'm doing this for your benefit or for mine. I'm just kind of doing it. I mean, it's very good to keep your hands clean. Um... And, and, and this pandemic we have, but on a, <clears throat> on a, uh, <laughs> on a better note, <clears throat> let, let, let's start the book. Chapter six, Shasta Among the Tombs. Shasta ran lightly along the roof on tiptoes felt hot on his bare feet. It was only a few seconds scrambling up the wall at the far end. When he got to the corner, he found um, he found himself looking down into a narrow, smelly street, and there was a rubbish heap against the outside of the wall, just as Corin had told him. Before jumping down, he took a rapid glance round him to get his bearings. Apparently, he had now come over the crown of the island hill on which Tash Barn is built. Everything sloped away before him, flat roofs below flat roofs, down to the towers and battlements of the city's northern wall. Beyond that was the river, and beyond the river a short slope covered with gardens, but beyond that again there was something he had never seen the like of. A great yellowish-grey thing, flat as a calm sea, and stretching for miles. On the far side of it were huge blue things, lumpy but with jagged edges, and some of them with white tops. The desert and the mountains, thought Chester. He jumped down onto the rubbish and began trotting along downhill as fast as he could in the narrow, in the narrow lane, which soon brought him into a wider street where there were more and more people. No one bothered to look at a little ragged boy running along on bare feet. Still, he was anxious and uneasy till he turned a corner and there sold a city gate in front of him. Here he was pressed and jostled a bit, for a good many people, other people, were also going out. And on the bridge beyond the gate the crowd became quite a slow pro a procession, more like a queue than a crowd. Out there, with clear running water on each side, it was deliciously fresh after the smell and heat and noise of Tash Barn. When once Chester had reached the far end of the bridge, he found the, he found the crowd melting away. Everyone seemed to be going either, either to the left or the right along the river bank. He went straight ahead up a road that did not appear to be much use between gardens. In a few places, in a few paces, he was alone, and a few more brought him to the top of the slope. There he stood and stared. It was like coming to the end of the world. For all the grass stopped quite suddenly, a few feet before him, and the sand began. Endless level sand, like on a seashore, but a bit rougher. As it was never wet. The mountains, which looked farther up, further off than before, loomed ahead. Greatly to his relief, about five minutes walk away on his left, what must certainly have been, um, <clears throat> excuse me, greatly to his l relief he saw, about five minutes walk away to his left, what must certainly be the tombs, just as Bree had described them. Great 
masses of mouldering stone shaped like gigantic beehives, but a bit narrower. They looked very black and grim, but the sun was now setting but right behind them. He turned his face west and trotted toward the tombs. He could not help looking out very hard for any sign of his friends, though the setting sun shone in his face so that he could hardly so he could hardly see anything. And anyway, he thought, of course they'll be round on the far side of the father's tomb, not this side where anyone might see them from the city. <clears throat> and here's a picture of the tombs right here. Can't exactly see them myself. Yeah, there they are. See how they kind of look like beehives? Yeah, there we are. Okay. <clears throat> there were about 12 tombs, each with low arched doorway that opened with into absolute blackness. They were dotted about in no kind of order, so that it took a long time going around this one and going around that one before you could be sure that you would look round every side of every tomb. This was what Shester had to do. There was nobody there. It was a very quiet there, out on the edge of the desert. And now the sun had really set. Suddenly, from somewhere behind him, there came a terrible sound. Shester's heart gave a great jump, and he had to bite his tongue to keep himself from screaming. Next moment, he realized what it was the horns of Tashban blowing for the closing of the gates. Don't be a silly little coward, said Chester to himself. Why, it's only the same noise he heard this morning. But there is a great difference between a noise heard letting you in with your friends in the morning and a noise heard alone at nightfall shutting you out. And now that the gates were shut, he knew there was no chance of the others joining him that evening. Either they're shut up in Tashbon for the night, thought Chester, or else they've gone on without me. It's just the sort of thing Erebus would do. But Pri wouldn't. Oh, he wouldn't, now, would he? In this idea about Erebus, Chester was once more quite wrong. She was proud and could be hard enough, but she was true as steel, and would never have deserted a companion whether she liked them or not. Now that Shester knew he would have to spend the night alone, it was getting darker every minute, he began to like the look of the place less and less. There was something very uncomfortable about those great silent shapes of stone. He'd been trying his hardest for a long time not to think of gulls couldn't keep it up any longer. Oh, oh, help! He shouted suddenly, for at that mo very moment he felt something touch his leg. I don't think anyone can blame him for shouting if something comes up from behind him and touches him, not in such a place and at such a time when he is frightened already. Chester, at any rate, was too frightened to run. Anything would be better than being chased round and round the burial place of the ancient kings with something he dared not look at and behind him. Instead, he did what was really the most sensible thing he could do. He looked round. His heart almost burst with relief. What touched him was only a cat. The light was too bad now for Chester to see much of the cat, except that it was big and very solemn. It looked as if it might have lived for long, long years among the tombs alone. Its eyes made you think it knew secrets it would not tell. Puss, puss, I suppose you're not a talking cat, said Shasta. The cat stared at him harder than ever. Then it started walking away, and of course Shasta followed it. It led him right through the tombs and out on the desert side of them. There it sat down, bolt upright, with its tail curled round its feet, and its face set toward the desert 
until Narnia in the north was still as if it were watching for some enemy. Chester lay down beside it, with his back against the cat and his face onward, um, and his face toward the tombs. But because if one is nervous, there's nothing like having your face toward the danger, having something warm and solid at your back. The sand wouldn't have seemed very comfortable to you or I, but Chester had been sleeping on the ground for weeks and hardly noticed it. Very soon he fell asleep, though even in his dreams he went on wondering what had happened to Bree and Erebus and when. He was wakened suddenly by a noise he had never heard before. Perhaps it's only a nightmare, said Chester to himself. At the same moment, he noticed that the cat had gone from his back. He wished it, he wished it hadn't. But he lay quite still without ever opening his eyes because he felt sure he would be more frightened if he sat up and looked round at the tombs and the loneliness, just as you or I might lie still with bedclothes over our heads. But then the noise came again, a harsh, piercing cry from behind him, out of the desert. And of course he had to open his eyes and sit up. The moon was shining brightly. The tombs, far bigger and nearer than he had thought they would be, looked grey in the moonlight. In fact, they looked horribly like huge people, draped in grey robes and covered with their heads and faces. <clears throat> they were not at all nice things to have near you when spending a night alone in a strange place, but the noise had come from the opposite side, from the desert. Chester had to turn around his back to the tombs like that very much, and stare across the level sand. A wild cry rang out again. I hope it's not more lions, thought Chester. It was, in fact, not very like the lion's roars he had heard on the day when he met Quinn and Erebus. It was really the cry of a jackal. But of course, Chester didn't know this. Even if he had known, he would not very much have wanted to meet a jackal. The cries rang out again and again. There's more than one of them, whatever they are, thought Chester, and they're coming nearer. I suppose that if he had been an entirely sensible boy, he would have gone through the tombs near to the river where there are houses, and wild beasts are less likely to come. But there were, but then there were, or he thought there were, the gulls. To go back through the tombs would mean going back through pack. Yeah, to go back through the tombs would mean going past those dark openings in the tombs and what might come out of them. It may have been silly, but Chester felt he'd rather risk the wild beasts. Then, as the cries came nearer and nearer, he began to change his mind. He was just going to run for it, when suddenly, between him and the desert, a huge animal bounded into view. As the moon was behind it, it looked quite black, and Chester did not know what it was, except, yeah, except that it had a very big, shaggy head, and went on four legs. It did not seem to have noticed Chester, for it suddenly stopped, turned its head toward the desert, and let out a roar! which re-echoed through the tombs and seemed to shake the sand under Chester's feet. The cries of the other creatures suddenly stopped, and he thought he could hear feet scampering away. Then the great beast turned to examine Chester. It's a lion! I know it's a lion! thought Chester. I'm done! Oh, I wonder will it hurt much? I wish it was over. What, what has happened to him then? I wonder, does anything happen to people after they're dead? Oh, here it comes! He shut his eyes and teeth tight. But instead of teeth and claws, he only felt something warm, lying down at his feet. And when he opened his eyes, he said, It's not nearly as big as I thought. It's only half the size. No, it's not even a quarter of the size. 
to declare it's only the cat. It's only the cat. I must have dreamed all that about being as big a, of it as being big as a horse. <clears throat> and whether he had really been dreaming or not, what was now lying down at his feet and staring at um, him out of countenance with its big green unwinking eyes was the cat. Though certainly one of the largest cats he had ever seen. Oh, puss, gasped Jasper. I am so glad to see you again. I've been having such horrible dreams. And he at once lay down again, back to back with the cat, as they had been at the beginning of the night. <clears throat> the warmth from it spread, yeah, spread all over him. I'll never do anything nasty to a cat again, as long as I live, said Chester, half to the cat and half to himself. He did once, you know. He threw stones at a half-starged mangy old... Shh. Hey! Stop that! You scratched me! For the cat had turned round and given him a scratch. None of that, said Chester. It isn't as if you can understand what I'm saying. Then he does stop. Next morning when he woke, the cat was gone. The sun was already up, and the sand hot. Chester, very thirsty, sat up and rubbed his eyes. The desert was blindingly white, and though there was a murmur of voices from the city behind him, where he sat, everything was perfectly still. When he looked a little left and west, so that the sun was not in his eyes, he could see the mountains on the far side of the desert, so sharp and clear that they were only a stone's um, though they looked only a stone's throw away. He particularly <clears throat> noticed one blue height that divided into two peaks at the top and decided it must be Mount Pyre. That's our direction, judging by what the raven said, he thought. So I'll, I'll just make sure of it so as not to waste any time when the others show up. So he made a good, deep, straight furrow with his foot pointing exactly to Mount Pyre. The next job, clearly, was to get something to eat and drink. Chester trotted back through the tombs. They looked quite ordinary now, and he wondered how he could have ever been afraid of them. <laughs> and he went down into the cultivated land by the riverside. There were a few people about, but not very many, for the city gates had been open several hours, and the early morning crowds had already gone in. So, he had no difficulty going in and doing a little raiding, as Bree called it. It involved a climb over a garden wall, and the results were three oranges, a melon, a fig or two, and a pomegranate. You can find those at your local grocery store. They're good. <clears throat> After that, he went down to the river bank but not too near the bridge, and had a drink. The water was so nice that he took off his hot, dirty clothes and had a dip. For, of course, Chester, having lived on the shore all his life, had learned to swim almost as soon as he had learned to walk. When he came out, he lay on the grass, looking across the water at Teshbon. All the splendor and strength and glory of it. But that made him remember the dangers of it, too suddenly realized that the others might have reached the tombs while he was bathing. And gone out on without me, as likely as not. So he dressed in a fright, and tore at such speed that he was all hot and thirsty when he arrived, and so the good of his bath was gone. Like most days, when you are alone and waiting for something, this day seemed about a hundred hours long. You had plenty to think of, of course, but sitting alone, just thinking was pretty slow. He thought a good deal about the Narnians, 
and especially about Corin. He wondered what had happened when they had discovered the boy who had been lying on the sofa and hearing all the secret plans wasn't really Corin at all. It was very unpleasant to think of all those nice people imagining him a traitor. But as the sun slowly, slowly climbed up to the top of the sky and then slowly, slowly began going downward to the west, and no one came, and nothing at all happened, he began to get more and more anxious. And of course, he now realized that when they arranged to meet for one another at the tombs, no one had said anything about how long. He couldn't wait here for the rest of his life. And soon it would be dark again. And he would, and he would have another night, just like last night. A dozen different plans went through his head, all wretched ones. At last, he fixed on the worst plan of all. He decided to wait till it was dark and then go back to the river and steal as many melons as he could and carry on and set out for Mount Pyre alone, trusting for his direction to the line he had drawn that morning in the sand. It was a crazy idea, and if he had read any books, as you or I, about journeying over deserts, he never would have dreamed of it, Shas said, read any books at all. Before the sun set, something did happen. Shasta was sitting in the shadow of one of the tombs when he looked up and saw two horses coming toward him. And his heart gave a great leap, for he recognized them as Bree and Wynn. But the next moment, his heart went right back down to his toes. There was no sign of Erebus. The horses were being led by a strange man, an armed man, pretty handsomely dressed, like an upper slave in a great family. Bree and Wynn were no longer got up like pack horses, but saddled and bridled. And what could it all mean? It's a trap, thought Chester. Somebody has caught Erevis, and perhaps they tortured her, and she's given the whole thing away. They want me to jump out and run up and speak to Bree, and then I'll be caught too. Yet if I don't... I may be losing my only chance to meet the others. Oh, I do wish I knew what had happened. And he skulked behind the tomb, looking out every few minutes, and wondering which was the least dangerous thing to do. And that is the end of chapter.